Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Siki Gislason. I'm the president of the European Association of Geochemistry. I have a short announcement to make before Roberta takes over. Uh, there have been some incidents outside the conference center. So the local authorities suggest that when you leave the conference centers, but you take off your uh, NERTAG and put it in your pocket. And when you enter, you know, you don't put your NERTAG on until you're inside the conference centers. This is for your security and make sure you, you protect your pockets and etc. Okay, moving to the more pleasant things. Um, Roberta Rutnik, the president of the Geochemical Society, will take over. Roberta. Good morning, everybody. Um, as president of the Geochemical Society, it is my pleasure to present two of our highest awards to a pair of very accomplished scientists. First, we start with the F.W. Clark Award, which is given to an early career scientist for a single outstanding contribution in geochemistry or cosmochemistry, published either as a single paper or a series of papers on a single topic. The medal is named for Frank Wigglesworth Clark, who was a chemist, uh, lived from 1847 to 1931, and was actually the first person to characterize composition of the continental crust. This year, the medal is presented to Thomas Kruyer, a postdoctoral scholar at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, whose research is aimed at determining the origin, accretion, and early evolution of planets. He is recognized for groundbreaking work on the hafnium tungsten system to understand the timing and dynamics of early solar system processes, including the age of Jupiter, the genetic heritage of meteorites, and the origin of the Earth-Moon system. We are very pleased to honor this bright young scientist and look forward to his future discoveries. Please join me in congratulating Thomas Kruyer on receiving the 2019 F.W. Clark Award. Next, we have the Geochemical Society's highest honor, named for Victor Moritz Goldschmidt, who is considered founder of our field. His classification of the behavior of elements in the Earth and meteorites laid the basis of modern geochemistry. The Goldschmidt Medal recognizes major achievements in geochemistry or cosmochemistry, consisting of either a single outstanding contribution or a series of publications that had great influence on the discipline. This year, the award goes to Don DiPaolo of the University of California, Berkeley, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Professor DiPaolo is currently the graduate professor of geochemistry and the chancellor's professor emeritus at UC Berkeley. His research involves the use of isotopic measurements as tracers and chronometers of Earth processes. A common theme is the development and application of reactive transport models to help understand how isotopes and trace elements respond in dynamic geochemical systems. He has tackled problems ranging from what controls the size of volcanic eruptions and magma chambers to difficult to date rocks to how the chemistry of the oceans has changed over Earth's history. This award recognizes his outstanding contributions to the development of new isotopic methods and their application to crust and mantle evolution, igneous and metamorphic petrology, ocean chemistry, and reactive chemical transport. That's quite a broad area. <laughs> Pretty much encompasses most of geochemistry. For a career with broad and lasting effects on geochemistry, we are proud to present Professor Don DiPaolo with a 2019 Victor Moritz Goldschmidt Medal. Don, please come up. Okay, so we also have one recipient who could not be here today. 
the, ninth, the 2019 Claire C. Patterson Award will go to Barbara Sherwood Lawler of the University of Toronto. She has pioneered environmental geochemistry methods based on compound-specific isotope analysis to detect and monitor the biodegradation of organic pollutants in water. Her award will be presented next year in Honolulu. And I would like to now invite Harui Masuda, Masuda excuse me, president of the Geochemical Society of Japan, to come forward. Thank you very much for introducing me. Now, I will give a presentation about the Geochemical Journal Award 2019 for Kenta Yoshida. The Geochemical Journal Award of 2019, the Geochemical Journal Award is presented annually to the authors of the most outstanding papers appeared in the Geochemical Journal during the previous year. The 2090 award is given to Kenta Yoshida, Rastam Orozbaev, Takao Hirajima, Akira Miyake, Akira Tsuchiyama, Appas Bakirov, Akira Takas, and Kalilbek Sakiev for their most understanding paper entitled Microexcavation and Direct Chemical Analysis of Individual Fluid Inclusion by Cryo FIB SEM EDS, application to the UHP talc garnet chloritoid cyst from the Macbar Metamorphic Complex, Kyrgyz Tianshan, published in Geochemical Journal, Volume 52, pages 959 to 67. Harue Masuda, President of the Geochemical Society of Japan, August 2019. Please come to you. Dr. Yoshida. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone. It's great to see so many of you here. So I'm delighted to introduce our second plenary by Roberta Rudnick. As many of you, well, as you all know now, Roberta is president of the Geochemical Society. She's also a professor at UC Santa Barbara, and she's pioneered um, Ge geochemical research into the evolution of the continental crust. Now, when I spoke to Roberta on Sunday, I said, you know, Roberta, how would you like me to introduce you? And in characteristically modest fashion, Roberta said, well, I've been president and vice president of the GS for four years, and it's still standing. But with her permission, I'm going to rephrase this slightly and say that Roberta has been president, or well, she is president, and she's been vice president of the GS for four years, and she's still standing, because this is an immense amount of work and commitment to, to our community that we're all very grateful for. So with that, I will let her begin her presentation. Well, thank you very much. Um, one of the duties of the president of the Geochemical Society is to give the plenary lecture uh, in the year that we're not running Goldschmidt, so it's my turn now. Next year will be Siggy in Honolulu. And uh, I wanted to start with a word from one of our co-sponsors, namely the Geochemical Society, uh, because um, I, I wanted to first remind you, I, I think many of the members probably already know this, that 
the society co-publishes GCA uh, along with the Meteoritical Society. Uh, we co-sponsor Goldschmidt meetings with the European Association of Geochemistry, and we run the Goldschmidt meeting in the even-numbered years. So next year will be Honolulu, and that will be uh, our meeting to run. We also publish Geochemical News. And our board of directors, oh, that doesn't seem to, oh, there, there we go. Um, our hardworking board of directors meets uh, once a year at the, at the site of the meeting, but this year we actually extended it by a day because the Geochemical Society is starting a strategic planning process. We've never done this in the history of the society. And what does that mean? Well, we met with a, with a facilitator to hash out what are some of our top priorities. And we came up with four, and I want to introduce those to you today and also encourage you, if you have any interest in this whatsoever, if you have interest in what the society should be doing, to please come forward and, and share, uh, maybe get involved with this process. So first priority or first goal is engagement. What does that mean? Uh, we want to increase the value that members receive beyond GCA and the Goldschmidt and other things that we do. Identity, we want to ensure that our members have a clear understanding of and a connection to the society and all that it offers. And then stewardship is to ensure the society identifies and promotes the best practices, professional conduct, uh, and excellence. And then finally, the foundation is to continually strengthen the society's capacity to evolve with the needs of our of our membership. And we have a huge number of young people here. A lot of students attend this meeting. You are the future of geochemistry. And so I'd really encourage you to think about maybe getting involved in this process. So what do you do if you want to get involved? Well, you, you can visit the Geochemistry Society booth. This is Kevin and uh, Maddie Burris, who uh, will be at the booth, either one or both of them. Or if you don't have time to do that, or if you're watching this online or something, uh, you can email the Geochemical Society office, okay? So that's the end of our word from our co-sponsor, and now we'll go on to the science. Well, the Earth probably started out looking something like the image on the left, um, a magma ocean, and we know today it looks like the image on the right, which was taken by the Apollo 17 astronauts uh, back in 1979, no, 72, okay, on their way to the moon. This is a very iconic image. Uh, it's widely credited with uh, starting the environmental movement because humans could see for the first time that here, here is our home and this is what we live on and we better do something to make sure that we can continue living on it. It's even more important today than it was back then. I like this image because it shows that the earth is has continents, that's what I work on. It's focused on Africa, I work in Africa, so it's, uh, it, it touches home for me. Okay, so if we compare Earth to the other terrestrial planets in our solar system, here they are, aligned by order from the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and uh, Mars, and they're in their approximate proportional sizes. We can see that each of these planets is very different from the other. And Earth is particularly unusual because we have this liquid water and we have an atmosphere and we have continents. And Earth's continents are unique. There is no other planet in our solar system that has this evolved crust, continental crust. And so we could ask some very fundamental questions about this, for example, why does the Earth have continents? And if, of course, if we didn't have continents, we wouldn't be here. We might be underwater, but we wouldn't be here. Um, we have the unique uh, factor that we have water, and we have life. And these were probably all interrelated in some way. And I think a very uh, strong argument could be made that we have continents because we have plate tectonics. Because plate tectonics, subduction in particular, is a great way to make granites, as Nick Arndt emphasized yesterday in his keynote talk. And why do we have plate tectonics is another very big question. We don't really know the answer to that, but water could be implicated. Well, 
the other importance of continents is that they provide one of our few ways of actually looking back in time in Earth history because all of our geological record is preserved in the continents. So I'm gonna to focus today on the continents and another important aspect of the continents shown in this slide here, this is a, uh, some of the uh, trace elements in the Earth, trace and, and minor elements. Um, these are ordered just in proportion to how abundant they are in the crust relative to the rest of the Earth. You can see that even though the continental crust is a very small portion of the planet, it's only 0.5% by mass of the silicate portion of our planet, very, very small, it has a large proportion of these elements. And highlighted in red here are the elements potassium, thorium, and uranium, which are the main heat producing elements. And whatever, of, what proportion of these elements is in the continental crust is what's been removed from the mantle. And these are the elements that power convection in the earth, that producing the heat. And so it's really quite, oops, I'm sorry, really quite important to know what the composition of the crust is so we can understand whole earth geochemistry. But some very important questions remain about the continents. And here are two of them that I'm going to address today. The first one is, we live on the continents. It's arguably, the continental crust is arguably the best characterized reservoir in the Earth. But how well do we really know it? And if you look back on all of the papers, including my own papers, you'll see that you, you're given a, a bulk composition, but there's usually no uncertainty associated with it. So, do, how well do we really know the composition? It's an important question. And the other question that I'd like to address is, has this composition changed over Earth history based upon the record that we have? So the crust is often divided into two or three layers. Um, a lot of this is based upon seismic data, like seismic refraction profiles shown here, uh, is a compilation that I did back in 1995 with David Fountain. We had an upper, middle, and lower crust. But within the, within the continental crust, the upper crust has the lion's share of these incompatible elements, the heat producing elements. So this is just a pie diagram to show how uh, the energy, which is from the potassium, thorium, uranium breaks down amongst these three parts of the crust. So the upper continental crust clearly dominates the incompatible trace element uh, composition of the crust. So I'm going to focus today specifically on the upper continental crust. How do we get an estimate of the average composition of this very heterogeneous area? Well, early on, the way that was done was people would go out and do grid sampling. Now this is meant to be illustrative, not literal, but the Canadian Shield is a very nice place where lots of hard rocks are exposed. So in the 1970s, the Canadian Geological Survey went out and sampled along grid points, made uh, outcrop weighted averages of each of those grid points and made composites and analyzed those. So this was published by Eden Farrig in 1973 of over 14,000 grid samples from the Canadian Shield. They analyzed them for the major elements and a few trace elements. And similar studies have been done elsewhere, uh, for example, in Russia by Ronov and Yaroshovsky. Um, in uh, the Canadian Shield, also by Dennis Shaw, different set of samples. And most recently in Eastern China by my, my colleague Gao Shan, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but that's how I got to know him because he did uh, this um, this big study of Eastern China doing these very, very labor intensive work to come up with average compositions. And that is exactly how, where actually, our major element compositions derive in all of these models. They, they go back to these sorts of, of um, studies. So then, that's major elements. Major elements in igneous rocks may vary by about a factor of two. You know, between a basalt and a Granite might be a factor of two in terms of silica content. But if we want to do trace elements, they, var they vary by orders of magnitude in the rocks that you find in the continental crust. And so it's much more challenging to use this sort of process to get a robust average of trace elements. And that's shown in, in if you look at the trace element data that these people, um, the estimates they made, there's quite a lot of variability. But there's a, a natural 
sampling process that, have, that people have utilized to try to pin down trace elements. And that is to use sediments as global averages with the idea that sedimentary rocks are the material that's deposited after weathering and erosion at the Earth's surfaces at the Earth's surface and probably give us a relatively good average of what is exposed. And I show here um, Scott McLennan and Ross Taylor, very famous for their book in 1985 and many, many decades of work on this, as well as other people. The targets are generally shales, fine-grained sediments, plus lurse. Uh, more recently, we've been doing uh, studies on glacial deposits, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But the idea is that you have quantitative transport of insoluble trace elements from the site of weathering to the site of deposition. And which elements are soluble and which are insoluble. This is again from Taylor and McLennan's book. And um, this is the log of uh, seawater partition coefficient versus residence time. All of the uh, elements in the, in the black uh, circles are the insoluble elements. So here are the rare earth elements, pretty insoluble. Uh, here's thorium, it's very insoluble. These are moderately soluble, and then these elements up here are very highly soluble. So you can see that you might have a good chance of getting good rare earth element and thorium data by this process, but it's not going to be so good for potassium and uranium because they're soluble. Um, we, if we take a look at the rare earth elements, this is a chondrite normalized plot, and up here are shown various groups uh, estimates of average shales through time, uh, not through time, modern shales, sorry, post archean Australian shale, North America shale composite, European shale, Eastern China, post archean shale. They all look pretty similar. Of course, it's a log plot, but they're pretty similar. Light rare earth enriched, slight negative europium anomaly, and flat heavy rare earth elements. And I mentioned LURS, which is a, a, a windblown glacial dust, and that's shown here in green. And you can see it looks pretty much the same, only slightly lower, possibly more, some quartz dilution going on there. So not coincidentally, everybody's estimates for the average rare earth element concentration or pattern of the upper continental crust looks just like these estimates because that's where they come from. Okay, so then one can, once you've got the rare earth elements uh, pinned down, you can look at plots like this, lanthanum versus thorium. These are data for LURS now, and also shown are some estimates for upper, so I'm show, pointing at the screen here, I should be pointing at this screen, uh, various people's estimates for upper continental crust. And so the idea is, well, if you could constrain the lanthanum concentration in the upper continental crust, then you can get the thorium. And so any insoluble element that has, shows a correlation like this can be derived by these sorts of plots. And hence, from the rare earth elements, derives all of the other trace elements for insoluble elements. But what I'd like to ask today is how well do we really know these rare earth element concentrations? We could argue the pattern we know very well, but how, what is the concentration? And in Taylor and McLennan's book, they, they said, well, we can look at the shale data, which I showed you. I'm going to go back from here for a second. Yeah, the shale data. Uh, and we, we, but we know that shales are only the clay portion and there should be some quartzites, there should be some carbonates. So they actually reduce the lanthanum concentration by about 20% and they, sit and they, and they pin that, that's the lanthanum concentration uh, of the upper continental crust and then everything else derives from that. So what's new? Well, there's a new study on LURS, it's not yet published. It was undertaken uh, by Zhao Chu Hu, who's at, who was a PhD student of Shan Gao's at China University of Geosciences in Wuhan, and he went out and collected about 100 samples of LURS and did some very high quality analyses for major elements and trace elements, including basically the whole periodic table, everything that you can analyze on a ICPMS or uh, thermal ionization, and he got some really nice data, and I'm going to show you some of those. So here's an example. LURS is a, is a mixture between the clay fraction and the quartz-rich fraction, and that's what we're seeing in this plot. So here's aluminum versus iron. You can see there's a really nice correlation for the LURS data, and we also included the data from Catherine Chevelle's work on LURS, which is high-quality uh, analyses. And all these plots I'm gonna show you in the next few minutes are going to be uh, 
Zhao Chu's data in green, Katrin's data in yellow, and uh, the inferred estimate of the upper continental crust based upon the aluminum concentration of the upper crust. And the aluminum concentration is fairly well known. It might vary by uh, two percent amongst different estimates, so it's not highly variable. So, and these in yellow are all of the um, previous estimates of upper continental crust composition. So that's iron, and you can see that iron, uh, the, the new result falls right within what we previously thought, it's within the scatter of estimates. But when we go to some other elements that are, uh, well, here's potassium. Well, potassium shows a very good correlation. Uh, again, the, the estimate is not outside of previous estimates. It may be a little, little bit on the low side. But when we go to some of the elements that are not so readily analyzed in the past, here's arsenic, for example. And there's a nice correlation, but you can see that the inferred com uh, composition of the crust for arsenic is about a factor of four higher than any previous estimate. Here is tin. It's a similar story, save for the one estimate up here. Here is, oops, here's antimony or antimony for my UK colleagues. Uh, Again, a huge difference between previous estimates of crust composition and what the LERS data are telling us. Here's bismuth, similar story. Here's thorium. We thought we knew thorium pretty well, but this suggests that the thorium concentration is probably too low because this trend does not go through the estimates. But that would be consistent perhaps with well, maybe our estimates were too low because lanthanum was diluted by 20%. I don't know. And here is lanthanum. And here you can see that the data tend to fall above esti current estimates of upper continental crust. Okay, so I'm going to sh show you one more slide from this study, and that is the um, rare earth element plot, chondrite normalized rare earth element plot. Uh, here is the, the new result from Ho et al., which is in preparation. And here's our recent work on glacial diamictites. Interestingly, they're, they're really identical, but they're different from the shale uh, data. So this is still work in progress. I don't have any major conclusions to, to share with you, except that it's likely that our estimates of upper continental crust composition are going to change for some elements. And not, not only that, but with these new data, we can use, we can actually put some uncertainties on it. For example, the lanthanum concentration, it is uh, higher than previous estimates, but it has about a 12% uncertainty at the two sigma level. Okay, now I want to change, I want to change tracks a little bit and look at the question of has, has this crust composition that we can now define pretty well using sediments of various sorts for present day crust, has it changed over Earth history? So we saw this picture previously, 4.6 4 approximately billion years ago, the Earth probably looked like this. Today, it looks like this. So how did it get there? How, how did we go from our magma ocean to what we see today? It's a huge, you know, period of time, of course. But we were, a few years back, we were thinking about how could we contribute to this? How could we get a new way of estimating the crust composition? And we thought what we would do is start to look at glacial deposits. So it turns out that this is an idea that dates all the way back to Goldschmidt. And I'd like to point out that here is a picture of a smiling Goldschmidt <laughs> that you I've never seen before, but this is, um, it's kind of neat to see him smiling. It wasn't normal in those years to, to smile when you had your, your picture taken. Anyway, he had the idea, glaciers move across the Earth's surface, and as they move, they physically erode the material that they're traveling over. So when they melt at the terminus, and this is just a picture from Greenland today, but back, you know, we had ice ages when the whole, almost all of the surface was of the, polar regions or some, maybe the whole earth was covered in ice and these glaciers were grinding away and producing these uh, material, this fine grain material. So Goldschmidt's idea was let's go out and sample that fine grain material and analyze it because it's going to give us a good average of the upper continental crust. 
Some of the adva potential advantages of this method would be that these deposits are less susceptible to weathering or, or, or sorting because these are diamictites by definition, they're unsorted uh, sediments. Uh, continental ice sheets, especially during the ice ages, covered very large regions of the continent. And so the idea was to go out and sample the fine grain matrix of these diamictites to determine the average composition of the upper continental crust. So the, the real hero in this project is Rich Gashnig, uh, who's now an assistant professor at UMass, uh, yeah, UMass Lowell. He uh, was a postdoc working on this. Um, he had to come over from studying granite, so it was a little uncomfortable for him, but I think he did a really great job. And here are, here's what we try, were aiming to do. First of all, we wanted to refine the composition of the upper continental crust. We wanted to determine uncertainties on the composition. We wanted to see if we, because we have glacial periods that go all the way back to the Archean 2.9 billion years ago, we wanted to see if there was any evidence that what the glaciers were scraping off in the past were the buried over Earth history. We wanted to investigate these lesser known elements, well, some of the ones I showed you earlier for Lurs. Um, and in fact, one of the big stories that came out of this related to molybdenum and the rise of atmospheric oxygen, which I'll show you in a moment. And then importantly, we wanted to create an upper crustal reference suite that would be available to the community uh, to study. And we've done this, and these samples are available. We've made composites. We have about 24 composites, which represent over 100 samples um, that we a average per um, formation. And many, many people are working on these. Um, just about, as you know, just about every element in the periodic table that has more than one isotope is now an isotope system. And so these are being analyzed for a very large variety of isotopes as well as trace elements. So as I said, we have lots of samples. They span the major glacial periods. We have only a few from the modern. Uh, that's something that we might be following up on. But we have, there were Paleozoic Gondwana glaciations. There was the Neoproterozoic episodes, often called the Snowball Earth episode, where the whole Earth may have been covered in glaciers. Paleoproterozoic was also very widespread glaciers. Um, and, and we have samples from different continents. And then the Archean, 2.9 billion years ago uh, in South Africa, oops, I see Katval lost its K, but <laughs> it should be Katval Craton. Uh, we have samples from three different deposits in South Africa. This is the sort of material we're working with. This is from the Heronian supergroup. Um, these are diamictites, so they're poorly sorted. We're avoiding the class and we're uh, taking the matrix out and, and analyzing that. So one of the very first discoveries that we made uh, is shown in this slide. I want to explain what this slide is. Uh, this is like a um, you know, trace element plot. In this case, normalized to upper continental crust. And or normalized a second time because, we, so if, if, how it varies from one tells us how it varies from, say, the Rudnick and Gao estimate of the upper continental crust. But we normalize a second time because these are these sediments or mixtures, they could have a lot of quartz, they could have a lot of carbonate, or they could have a lot of iron formation. And so that would produce a spread in the, where the absolute uh, concent or normalized concentrations. And in order to get rid of that spread and condense it back, we normalize to an insoluble element, maybe yttrium or aluminum to, to remove this dilution effect. And what you can see from this slide, this is ordered by age. So this is Mesoarchean, Paleoproterozoic, Neoproterozoic, and Paleozoic. We, what you can see, first of all, is almost all of these are depleted in strontium, and that's a weathering signature. Well, we didn't expect these to be weathered because we had this concept that the glaciers were crossing hard rock and, and, and taking off unweathered rock, but in fact, they were, they're crossing very weathered regolith, and that's what we're sampling in these, in these um, deposits. So that was a surprise. But interestingly, if we look at molybdenum, you can see that there's no molybdenum depletion in the Mesoarchean and most of the Paleoproterozoic until we get to the very latest pale, uh, Paleoproterozoic and we start to see molybdenum being depleted and then it's systematically depleted in the younger deposits. This is reflecting the rise of atmospheric oxygen because molybdenum, which is probably a six plus in igneous rocks, when it weathers out of the rock, 
uh, in a reducing atmosphere, it presumably converted to four plus and it's stabilized on the continents because four plus molybdenum, like four plus uranium, is very insoluble. But once, the rise, once atmosphere, uh, atmospheric oxygen rose significantly, that molybdenum at the surface became six plus molybdenum, which is soluble and it got washed off of the continents. And this is sort of the complement to what people who study black shales see. People working on black shales are uh, samples from eucinic basins or, or, or perugenous basins uh, in the oceans, and they're seeing that molybdenum concentrations in those samples tick up over time across the GOE for precisely the same reason. They're capturing the molybdenum that's being removed from the continents. And this is shown also, it's not just molybdenum. These are some cross plots. This is, I should, I should mention that we can, oops, sorry, we can quantify the degree of depletion here just like we would do for europium anomaly, interpolate, and then divide by the, the, measure, the measured value divided by the interpolated value. So a value less than one means it's depleted, a value over one means it's enriched. These cross plots show molyb... Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> uh, cross plots show the molybdenum anomaly, so one is no anomaly. Here is the molybdenum depletion, this would be molybdenum enrichment. They show that there's this breakdown between two, two main quadrants here. Uh, the area in blue is the anoxic weathering regime. The area in yellow is the oxic weathering regime. So molybdenum is being depleted and so is vanadium, which is also redox sensitive. Its solubility depends upon its redox state. And thorium and uranium. As I said before, uranium is redox sensitive. So that was pretty interesting. We were not expecting that. Uh, it was um, quite an interesting result. The other thing that we saw, and this is a similar plot as I showed earlier, but it's a different set of elements now. This is the heavy rare earth elements and then transition metals. And these are color coded, black and blue are the ancient uh, Archean Paleoproterozoic deposits, red and green are the uh, Paleozoic and um, uh, Neoproterozoic deposits, so this, these would be pre-GOE, post-GOE. Here's the vanadium you can see shows this complementary relationship, presumably because of this we oxidative weathering. But there's also complementary relationships here. Chromium is high, chromium is low, uh, which is probably not due to oxidative weathering. It's probably due to igneous differentiation. And certainly, nickel cobalt, nickel and cobalt are two, uh, two plus cations, so they don't care how much oxygen is around. You can see that the nickel cobalt ch ratio changes systematically from the very high nickel cobalt to very low nickel cobalt. So these older deposits have, first of all, higher transition metals, and secondly, they have this very distinct ratio in cer certain trace elements like nickel cobalt, very different from the younger deposits. And we think that this is reflecting the overall differentiation of the upper continental crust, and that the crust likely changed from a much more mafic composition in the Archean to a much more evolved composition in the post-Archean. So Ming Tang, who was a PhD student uh, when, while we were working on this, who's now currently a postdoc at Rice and is soon to be taking up a professorship at uh, Peking University, um, he, he got interested in this and he took it to a, the next logical step, which is to look at shales through time. So here's nickel cobalt for igneous rocks. As a function of MGO, you can see it's a pretty good predictor of uh, how mafic the crust is, uh, or the rocks that you're sampling. Here's chromium zinc. This is a ratio he came up with independently that shows a similar sort of correlation. And here is where Archean sediments plot, very high nickel cobalt. Here's where post-Archean sediments plot, and the same for chromium and zinc. So this is, this is the actual data that he compiled, shales 508 samples from the literature, 139 diamictites. And you can see that there is this general trend that I mentioned earlier. And these are just the averages as a function of time. And this is not um, probably influenced by geography because you can go to any continent and see the same trends. So this is depositional age versus nickel cobalt. Here you can see we have Western Australia, South Africa, North America, et cetera. So this is a global trend in the data. 
So Ming said, well, we can use these data. He did a Monte Carlo simula simulation of taking igneous rocks, uh, randomly sampling igneous rocks. If we, if we know the nickel cobalt ratio from the sediments, we can estimate, for example, the magnesium concentration of the crust. Because we can't do that directly. Magnesium is a very soluble element. But by this method, we can infer what the more soluble element concentrations are, and importantly, the major element concentrations. And so this is uh, some plots from his paper that came out in 2016. This is depositional age versus inferred magnesium concentrations. You can see it was, it was very, very high based upon these sediments in the Archean, and then it changed systematically across the Archean to values that are very similar to what we, pre we think the present day upper crust is now. And this is just an estimate of what might that lithological variation look like in the crust. Here's early Archean dominated by basalt. Uh, definitely there were granites. Here's you know, like about a quarter percent granites, but there were also commodities, which are going to be, of course, very high in these transition metals. And we were thinking very simplistically, well, what would cause this change from a mafic to a much more felsic crust? Well, I said earlier, subduction is really good at creating granites. So we took the leap and said, well, maybe what we're seeing here is a fundamental change in tectonic regime on the Earth from a, a, a mafic dominated upper crust that might have been produced uh, through um, what some people call heat pipe or maybe um, uh, uh, well, more like a Venus type situation, I guess, a lot of uh, basaltic uh, extrusions to one where we have a lot, of, we pump a lot of granites into the crust due to the onset of subduction. But one could wonder, do these changes reflect truly reflect the less evolved crust, or are they just a change in the ultramafic end member? Because nickel and cobalt are certainly going to be dominated by commodities. And so the last little bit of the talk, um, I'd like to highlight some recent work by Kang Chen, who is at CUG Wuhan and spent a year or two in our laboratory, worked uh, with Ming, and is now um, back in CUG. And he, d he realized that there's another proxy we can use to uniquely, or specifically, I should say, pin down how much uh, basalt was in the crust based upon insoluble elements and sediments. And this is based upon copper, copper concentrations. So this is a plot of MGO, again, for igneous rocks versus copper concentration. And what you can see is that felsic rocks have very low copper concentrations. Basalts, uh, commodities have low concentrations. But as these igneous rocks differentiate, the copper increases systematically uh, due to differentiation until, until sulfide becomes saturated. And then copper is obviously a calcophile element, goes into the sulfide and drops off precipitously. Um, this is. Um, so this is MGO, this is silica, right? So basalts have a very high copper, but not felsic rocks and not commodities. And so this could give us a handle, but using the copper concentration in sediments like the diamictites, a handle on how much basalt was really in the crust. And so this is, these are what the diamictite data look like. This is depositional age, he, he analyzed uh, copper by isotope dilution for composite samples in orange, individual samples in green. Again, you can see there's a very clear trend in the data to relatively high copper concentrations to lower con concentrations as we get to younger uh, rocks. These are the median in purple. This is the average, and they're, they're pretty much the same within uncertainty. So, um, so it looks like there was a lot more basalt and how much more, oh, one, one more thing. Uh, he also analyzed silver by isotope dilution. And copper-silver ratios are very different for felsic versus basalt, but they're not unique. High ratios are also found in commodities, but the copper-silver ratio changes through time in the, with these samples. So he did some mass balance calculation to try to constrain how much uh, basalt does that mean we need to have in order to uh, have this copper concentration. And these are the results. This is the, depends on how much commoditeite you put in the crust. So you can add more commoditeite. If you had zero commoditeite, you'd have a, a crust that was 75% uh, basaltic, the rest felsic. But as you add commoditeite, these proportions both drop. 
But the important thing here is that basalt, these data suggest that basalt makes up 90, 50, sorry, 50 to 90 percent of the exposed crust in the Archean, in the, uh, the oldest samples that we have, 2.9. So, um, just, I just want to uh, wrap up here. Um, it looks to me, uh, I know, so this is, I should also mention that there's a session here uh, that's going to look at the sedimentary record using sediments uh, through Earth history. This is a controversial topic. Other people have come up with different, uh, have come up with estimates of a much more felsic crust. But I, I find that these arguments are compelling. And what does it mean for the Earth? Well, maybe we had a transition from an intraplate, uh, plume-driven uh, crust, much like we have on Venus today, and probably on Mars, in the ancient Mars, um, to a subduction zone magmatism. So we saw, let's see, Nick showed something like this yesterday. This is Pilbara Craton with these granite domes and surrounded by greenstones. That's, and then maybe it looks very different from what we see, for example, in a modern arc. So one other note is that on Friday's plenary talk, Chris Hawksworth is going to uh, address the question of when did plate tectonics start? This is another unanswered, well, let's just say nobody agrees. <laughs> but Chris will give you a view, um, and there will be, there's other views on all of this which is what makes our science vibrant, really. Um, okay, so, so just to sum up then, Earth's continents through time, well, we started out looking like this. Maybe the Earth went through an early transition uh, after the magma ocean solidified. We still had to lose heat, so maybe that was largely plume-driven, uh, like it has been on Venus. And, and of course, there's just a caveat to mention here, which is that we really need another mission to Venus. <laughs> Mars has gotten all of the attention, and Mercury, and they've been great. We've learned a, a huge amount. We haven't been to Venus really to see the surface, to probe the surface for some time. It's, it's very, very difficult to do. But boy, we could learn a lot about Earth, I think, by understanding Venus better. But to our knowledge, there are very limited, if any, felsic rocks on Venus. And so maybe the Earth went through a stage like that and then finally, after uh, the development of plate tectonics, ended up to what we have today. And with that, I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, we've now got some time for questions, if people would like to use the um, microphones um, in the aisles. There's Francis. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you for this uh, great talk. Um, yeah, there's a terrible echo here. Um, I have a suggestion for some elements that you mentioned in the last part of your talk, in particular nickel cobalt fractionation. Nickel cobalt is fractionated by soil formation. And actually, you by what? Sorry? By soil formation. Solid formation. And you may have actually a change in sediments depending on whether you have the more detrital or more soluble uh, fraction. It's all due to adsorption on iron hydroxides. So maybe you want to take a look at this. Okay, thank you. What about chrome zinc? <laughs> it's, about the, it's about the same. It's about okay. the same. <laughs> Do we have any further questions? Yeah. Over here. Okay. Uh, just ab about uh, Venus as an early analog for Earth, as an Archean analog. Venus doesn't seem to have the potential to have plate tectonics having, you know, a much lower water level. So, um, yep. yeah. So, does that have any implication on Venus as potentially a late Earth? rather than earlier. Oh, <laughs> we're going to turn into Venus? <laughs> I don't think so because, um, you know, the, the heat production is dying out, so the volcanism, pr um, production of magma in the Earth will, will be very low as time goes on because there's just not enough heat to generate the magmas. So I don't think we're going to revert to Venus, but, um, but, you know, just, I mean, people have suggested this idea, this, uh, this possible analogy between Venus and early Earth. But, if, but what's compelling to me is that 
it's not only Venus, but you look at Mercury, uh, you look at Mars. As we heard yesterday by Beth, in Bethany Elman's talk, she's focusing mostly on the, um, you know, the, the hydrological cycle on Mars, the surface weathering phenomenon. But if you, if you think back to her talk, there's all this olivine everywhere, and it's all mafic. Uh, it's really dominated by mafic rocks. And so all three of the other terrestrial planets are basaltic. Um, and to me, that's probably what the early Earth looked like as well. It's mm -hmm. just a question of when did it transition to what we, you know, much more felsic material. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Charlotte. Oh. Hi, Roberta. Great uh, talk. I was wondering a, a couple of things. I'm looking at this problem more from the granitic end than the mafic end, as per usual. Are you guys doing XRD analysis on all your sediments? Can you tell me what minerals are in there? Oh, XRD? Yep. Um, yes, on the, on the diamictites. Yes. Uh, we're in the process of doing that. Um, and so zircon would be a mineral that you might want to try to uh, track back to. Well, oh, Rich Gashnig, so zircon, uh, he's, he's been dating the detrital zircons in these to source you know, figure out right. what, what's the age. Obviously, you know, the, the material that these deposits are, are representing is older, but we don't yes. know how old, much older. One thing I didn't point out, um, I don't know if I can quickly go back to the slide that showed the, this one. Um, one thing I didn't point out is that there's a, there's a green, oh, darn it. <laughs> okay, there's a green sample up here and they think, what's that doing up there? That's Paleozoic. But it turns out this is in South Africa, West Dwika, and its source region is, is very old. So the reason it's up there is because the glaciers were, they were depositing their sediment 300 million years ago, but they were in fact sampling very ancient rock, Archean uh, and early Paleoproterozoic. So, but, but some of these samples, some of these deposits have already have published a trital zircon data for them. Uh, Rich Gashnig has additional unpublished data that's probably going to be published in the near future. So some of it is about amount as much as age for these purposes. Say again? The amount of zircon. Oh, does the, zir the yeah, amount yeah. of zircon change? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. And lastly, there's an embarrassing absence of Australian data in your database. Yes. <laughs> so I've heard tell that there's 2.9 billion year old glacial diamectite in Western Australia, but I've not seen anything published on it. Um, boy, it would be very interesting to, to look at that. So I guess we've got time for a, a final couple questions. Can you see the board? Oh, here, no? Yes, yes. I'm here. Hi, Roberta. Hi. Um, <laughs> One of the things that strikes when you walk across the crust is the heterogeneity of the crust. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, now that we have all this wealth of data over time, can we learn something by looking at the heterogeneity over mm -hmm. time rather than the average only? Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Um, I'm not sure what one would look at in these mixed up sediments. I mean, zircon proportion, maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so something to think about. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Got a shout. Yeah, oh, no. So the question was, were they all, whether they Lurs data all Chinese? No, it's Lurs from it pretty much everywhere you can find Lurs. So all, all the continents, Tajikistan, Argentina, uh, China, of course, Central US. Yeah, they're global. Yep. Okay. Well, with that, Great. let's thank Roberta again. And, um, <laughs>